So in keeping with the theme of this whole series, sustainable energy, I want to consider some of the possibilities and constraints for nuclear energy under that framework. And so I've deliberately chosen a somewhat provocative title here, inexhaustible fission energy, because it may not be renewable in the classic sense of the de definition, but it can be considered inexhaustible. Um, so it can be considered equivalent um, in terms of supplying essentially as much energy as we require for as long as we want. Now, of course, we've built our industrial society on the back of intense energy sources, but chemical energy sources, fossil fuels predominantly. So 300 years ago, we were a 100% solar society. Indirectly or indirectly, we got all of our energy from solar, whether that be windmills to grind grain or beasts of burden, human muscle power, you know, it all comes from biomass, from solar energy, from wind power, um, which is indirect solar energy and so on. Whereas once we built our industrial society, we relied on intense fossil fuel energy sources, which are inherently finite, but some of these sources um, are abundant. So something like coal is a good example where, yes, we've burned a lot of coal, it's contributing to greenhouse gas pollution, but there's a lot more coal that is potentially accessible if you're willing to pay the price. And that's the case, in fact, with many mineral resources. Now, if you look at the problem we face in terms of, of decarbonising Australia's economy, the world economy, uh, these problems are growing, they're not getting smaller. Well, what I've illustrated here are, are, are two things. Um, up the top we have China, and it's growing greenhouse gas emissions, and that is directly correlated with its growing energy demand, coming largely at, at right now from fossil fuels, from burning coal especially. Huge growth because it's such a large population base, growing rapidly, and on a per capita basis, you might be surprised to know that China has now equaled France in terms of its CO2 emissions per capita. So it's, it's no longer a bit player in the global energy market. It's in fact the world's largest energy consumer. Huge population base growing at around 10% per year. Then we have a country like Australia. This is a figure from the Garneau Climate Change Review. And here we have a problem that Australia is very heavily dependent right now on fossil fuels for our stationary energy generation. It's almost all from coal, different sorts of coal and gas. And if you take account of these other energy sources, well, that's almost all from oil. So if we're going to move to a pathway where we have ongoing economic growth, cutting our emissions, there's a huge gap to fill there. And I think it would be foolish in the extreme to rely on just a few energy sources and discount others if we're going to be confident about filling that gap. Now, if we look more fundamentally at energy itself, well, it only comes from two sources. One of them is nuclear fusion comes from the sun, and the other one is nuclear fission. Now, nuclear fusion, ultimately, through solar energy, can be stored in a chemical energy form, fossil fuels or gas. Nuclear fission can be liberated from heavy elements, um, and that's a form of energy that we've really only harnessed in the last few decades on any serious level. Um, so the question really becomes how intense do we want our primary energy source and... and um, and how much can it provide? Now, if we look at what's happening today worldwide, this is a figure from the International Energy Agency, for the different sources worldwide of energy, and as I said earlier, most of it comes from coal, oil and gas right now. Of the nuclear and renewable options, they're much smaller, obviously, renewable is almost all combustible waste. So renewable energy mostly comes from forms that are fit for service for baseload generation, um, that are dispatchable. Um, the other large renewable energy source is hydroelectricity right now. That forms around 2.2%. And then of the remaining geothermal energy, conventional geothermal energy, uh, provides a large amount of the remainder. Now, nuclear, uh, sorry, wind and solar and tidal, which we've talked about in previous um, sessions, are obviously growing, but can they grow fast enough to fill the gap? Well, if we look at projections for future energy growth, then you can go to any number of august international organisations and find completely different energy projections. And I think that reflects the fact that no one really has a good idea about how this is going to develop in the future. Now, because this is a talk on nuclear energy, I've chosen one from the World Nuclear Association. If you went to the Energy Information Administration, 
um, you'd find a quite different one. If you went to Greenpeace, you'd find a very different one again. But the World Nuclear Association suggests that anywhere from uh, 50 to 80 per cent of our electricity could ultimately come from nuclear energy, with a, f a fair amount also coming from new renewables and, and fossil fuels with CCS. Uh, worryingly, they also project that there will be this ongoing gap, clean energy gap, they call it, uh, between what we would like to have in terms of the pace of replacing fossil fuels and what is realistic. Now, I think the most telling illustration of the potential of nuclear energy and the potential of techno-solar, so non-hydro renewable energy sources, is to look at the best that has historically been achieved. Now, we can put aside arguments about why this may have been the case. Let's just look at what we know has occurred. And if we want to do that, then the most successful nation for generating nuclear electricity has been France. And that's illustrated on this side. And the most successful nation for deploying non-hydro renewable energy has been Denmark. And that's on this side of the graph. Now, the yellow here is nuclear electricity in France. The blue is hydro. Now, if we go back to the late 1970s, France had very little nuclear electricity, but it made a decision back in the early 1970s after the oil shocks on the basis of energy security predominantly to go to nuclear electricity. And what I think is astounding is the rate at which nuclear power was deployed in France once the decision was made. So we went from less than 20% of electricity coming from it to over 80% in that 20-year time frame. So a nation the size of France was at its peak building around six nuclear power plants per year to do that, and it now has around 60 of them. So this is an example, um, now there are many contributing factors, but an example of what can be done. So today, France's electricity supply, at least, is almost carbon free. It's at around 90 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. Now, if we look at Denmark, they've made a decision to invest heavily in wind power. And so this is Denmark over here. The purple is coal, and then we have oil and gas. The red is wind energy, and the orange is biomass. Um, so Denmark gets, on average, around 19% of its electricity from wind power. But it struggled to push beyond that. And Denmark is already an interesting, in an interesting situation because it's so interconnected with the European grid and Scandinavian hydro and so on that it can export wind power and import um, hydroelectricity on demand. Um, gives it a very flexible way of operating. Now, I'm not saying that Denmark shows the limits of techno-solar. I hope it doesn't. Um, I'm certainly saying that nuclear can be a large part. France illustrates that that's the case. But if you want to be sure, or you want to have a good assurance at least, that uh, one, uh, one method is technically possible, then you can't dismiss nuclear power on the basis of what's gone on in the real world. Now, if you look at cost of electricity, and Kim talked a bit about this, it's a really fundamental driver because in short-term decision-making, you're going to invest in energy sources that are most cost-effective. Um, now, this is the results of some work I've been doing with some colleagues, um, and this is currently under review in, in the journal Energy, looking at the last 10 years of authoritative studies, so from organisations such as the International Energy Agency, Energy Information Administration, MIT, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, looking at the levelised costs of electricity from different energy sources. Over here we have carbon intensive technologies, so various coal-based technologies. Over here we have nuclear, first of a kind nuclear, so the plant in Finland, for instance, the first one built there for many years, would be in that category and then established nuclear. And these are various carbon capture and storage technologies and solar thermal currently with gas backup. Um, and if you look at the kilograms of CO2 per megawatt hour, then nuclear is very low. I mean, you'd have to take into account the energy that goes into constructing the plant, mining the fuel, decommissioning and so on, that's all included in there, but it is still has the potential to be much lower emitting than these other technologies. Solar could only come down if you can remove your reliance on gas as a backup, so if you can go to molten salts, for instance. Uh, but the fundamental issue from this graph is that current authoritative studies say nuclear is the cheapest low-carbon option. The problem is, as Kim pointed out, that the capital costs, the upfront costs are high. The operation and maintenance, the fuel costs are very low. So the levelised cost is low, but the risk 
in building the plants, if you're building large plants that require a large investment up front, is much higher. Now, if you put a carbon price on top of nuclear electricity or any other form of electricity, then you find that fossil fuels, such as pulverised coal here, which is the one we burn in Australia, it's very sensitive to a carbon price, going from zero, where we are today, through to $180 a tonne, whereas something like nuclear is very insensitive to a carbon price because it's so low carbon emitting. Um, and indeed, various other energy technologies will also become favoured as the carbon price rises. But you need around $50 or $60 a tonne to get something like carbon capture and storage being competitive with pulverised coal right now. Here's me and a bunch of people standing outside the Experimental Breeder Reactor in Idaho Falls, and there's their fuel cycle facility. This is a new type of technology that has the potential to make nuclear energy sustainable over the long term. It's called the fast reactor. Now, the difference between a fast reactor and today's nuclear technology is profound. Today's nuclear technology is called a once-through cycle, a throwaway cycle. You mine the uranium, you create fuel rods, you run them in the reactor and then you throw them away and you have to store them over long periods of time. Whereas a fast reactor cycle with the recycling of the fuel is what's called a closed fuel cycle. And through multiple recycles, you can extract huge amounts of energy from the uranium. So in today's technology, we end up generating around 35 tonnes of high-level waste per year uh, from an average of 250 tonnes of uranium for a one gigawatt reactor running for a year. Now, some of that needs to be managed for thousands of years in a long-term repository before it uh, decays to background radiation levels. Whereas in a fast reactor, you require one tonne into a, instead of 250 tonnes of mined uranium. And the amount of waste that can be separated out then is quite different. Uh, because all of the long-lived waste is burnt in the reactor, what remains is about 1 50th in volume of um, current technology, and uh, it requires isolation for no more than a few hundred years rather than tens of thousands of years. But why aren't we going to this sort of technology right now? Well, there are various historical reasons, and one of them is if uranium is cheap and we don't have to make a hard decision on what to do with nuclear waste, then it can make sense in the short to medium term to simply invest in what we have now rather than moving to some new technology. As Gus said, it takes time and it takes many drivers to introduce these new technologies, even if they are much more efficient. So the prospects are great. I mean, if you ran um, all of your society on these fast reactors, then all of the energy needs for your entire life, your electricity needs, the synthetic fuels that you may generate to replace oil for your aircraft flights, for your car and so on, for producing all of your food, food all of it, could be wrapped up in a lump of uranium or thorium the size of a golf ball. That's your footprint for your life. And the waste could fit into a Coke can. It's a little larger than that because you've um, transmuted that into lighter elements that are less dense. But basically a Coke can needs to be managed for around 300 years is your legacy of environmental pollution um, for your entire lifespan under this sort of scheme. Whereas if it's based on coal, then you'll have a very large mountain of coal ash and a vast amount of CO2 floating around in the atmosphere is your legacy. It's my legacy as well. I would just rather it not be the case. And then there's a vast amount of energy that becomes opened up so that nuclear power becomes one of those inexhaustible energy sources. If we look at current energy reserves in the US, for instance, this slide was made back in 1994, but it illustrates the point. The US has a lot of coal not much oil and gas left, but if you recycle its uranium fuel, then it has vast amounts more energy than even coal. Indeed, if you were to reprocess all of the nuclear waste that's been generated to date in the US and to use all of its depleted uranium that's sitting around in stockpiles, the US has mined enough uranium already to power all of its energy needs for about a thousand years before you even need to mine it again. Now, in Australia, um, and we'll probably revisit this, quest this topic in, in the questions again, it's nuclear energy is not a fast fix. But ultimately, I would argue that none of them are fast fixes that we've talked about, whether it be enhanced geothermal systems or it be large-scale wind power 
or if it be solar thermal with large scale storage, all of these technologies are going to take time to deliver significant cuts to our dependence on fossil fuels. And nuclear is no different. One difference with nuclear is that the technology itself, at least the once through cycle, is very well established. The constraint is that we haven't got the regulatory framework in place, the experience, the political will to actually get it here. Uh, so in the short term, I don't see there's any way we're going to drastically cut Australia's emissions. But in the medium to long term, 20, 30, 40 years, there are a whole range of technologies, including nuclear, that could come and to be a major participant in our future energy supply. Now, I'll conclude this little t um, part of the talk with a, with a quote. Um, I don't expect you to read it, but you can look at the slides afterwards, but I'll read it to you. It comes from a recent book, Atomic Awakening, a new look at the history and future of nuclear power, published in 2009, written by a nuclear engineer, but um, very well written, actually, very well worth reading. And he concludes um, that my purpose is not to sell nuclear power because there's no longer a reason to sell it. Nuclear power, waiting quietly in its coma, has now become inevitable. That is, the ultimate need for nuclear power has finally caught up with its mad dash to develop. Whether you like it or not, the industrial world no longer has a choice. The age of burning coal and gasoline is over as atmospheric chemistry and general environmental pollution has approached states of crisis and hydrocarbons are becoming too expensive to burn. We need wind power, solar power, geothermal, hydro and anything else we can think of, but the base power source <coughs> must be constant running high output nuclear stations. The real expansion of nuclear power is now just awakening. So the point here is that nuclear power developed in the 1950s and 60s, it probably got ahead of itself. Fossil fuels were too well established and too cheap. But as we approach uh, the need to re totally replace fossil fuels this century, nuclear power will awaken as one of the major energy sources this century. And what we need to be doing is thinking critically about how we allow it the space to compete on a level playing field with the other low carbon options we have to move ourselves away from fossil fuels and give us long term energy security. Thank you. One of the questions I'd like us to pick up on first is the question of mitigating risk. And I guess our society is increasingly used to the question of mitigating risk. And one of the, it was interesting to see the, the figures that Barry put up um, about the costs of what is available today. We all know there's lots of projections as to what costs could be and everyone you talk to will have a different mix of um, projections depending on their background and which industry they belong to or which political view viewpoint they hold. But the only thing we know about what is certain is what the costs are today. And as a society, we do need to prepare, recognise that investments take a long time, that carbon that we put out today is going to continue to go forward. So I'd like you perhaps both to comment a bit more both from the legal perspective and the uh, and the options that Barry's talked about, about our need for society to mitigate risk and where nuclear power can potentially play a role I in, in that challenge. Well, from my perspective as a lawyer, a good example of how law functions in this type of situation is CCS as the alternative to nuclear. Actually, that's one of my questions, whether how you see <laughs> carbon capture and storage, because that's usually mentioned as the alternative. But in that framework, law has a particular function. We all know all the proje projections are different, but they all say that we are heading to trouble. Now, and everybody agrees that something has to be done. In case of CCS, for once, the legislator has actually taken a very proactive approach. And in many countries, even with no viable projects even coming, the legislation starts to be in place. Now, I don't know 
I assume that Australia has a legislation on CCS already in place. European Union has one. Many of the developing countries have them, even if I really doubt that they will ever have a CCS system, they have the law in place. So for once, the lawyers have taken the proactive approach, because normally law follows whatever the industry does with a time leg of a couple of years. But that's a good example where the public awareness and all this has caused a proactive approach to emerge. I don't know about the legal uh, question of CCS, but I don't think there is a major impediment. I mean, certainly it's one of those technologies that's supported by government, at least funded by government. Um, if, you, if you try and break down the, the problem of the cost of CCS logically, then you know axiomatically it cannot be cheaper than current fossil fuels because it's current fossil fuels plus a range of technologies to make it low carbon. Um, so that we know that um, the cost can never be lower than what we're paying today for electricity. And almost certainly it'll be higher, potentially much higher. Um, whereas a lot of the other technologies, nuclear, new generation nuclear, new generation solar and wind, they have the potential for the prices to fall much further. Uh, but it does interact strongly, I think, with a carbon price and also with with how far along that developmental chain they are, whether, whether the technology is mostly commercialised and ready to deliver or whether it's sort of way on the horizon that will affect how fast it drops down the cost curve. But also there's this chicken and egg problem with if something is very expensive today and it might become cheap when you've deployed it on a large scale, who's going to pay to deploy it on a large scale before it becomes cheap? And that's where you need large scale subsidies from government. So you need government to be picking winners. But that's a very dangerous practice because if you pick the wrong winner, then it may be that the costs come down only half as much as the cost of another technology. And, and, and so it's a real dilemma. Um, and I think for Australia, um, we are picking winners right now, perhaps dangerously. And we're often lambasting other countries for picking alternatives such as nuclear. But if you, in the cold, hard light of day, you evaluate the energy program of a country like China, there is only one reason why they're choosing to deploy 25 new nuclear reactors today with plans to build about another 50 more uh, within the next 10 years, and that is that they consider it to be cost effective. If they didn't consider it to be cost effective, they would not be doing this. Now, they are building wind as well. They are building solar, but not at the same rate. They're building a lot of coal because they figure coal will continue to be cost effective and there won't be any carbon price in the short term. But if you're trying to anchor those costs to reality as well, I think you've got to look at what the hard-nosed decisions of different nations are making. Why are the Gulf states all moving from powering their electricity sources from natural gas to nuclear? I think something like the United Arab Emirates, it's bought four 1.4 gigawatt reactors from South Korea and paid the, the sort of premiums to get the whole industry up and going there. It's great. It's a great area for solar thermal technology. The United Arab Emirates is a desert state and they're not deploying solar technology on a large scale. You know, it's a matter of economic realities and it's a matter of what is here and now versus what is possible. They are difficult interacting problems that I think um, really does open up that question about the arguments thrown up about the cost of nuclear electricity and the realities of what's going on today. It is difficult often to reconcile those. Perhaps worth making another point in that I guess Australia is um, fairly heavily dependent really on the international scene as to which technologies get developed at which rate. Most energy technologies, so the, the companies which develop technologies are based offshore. Australia plays a, a small role, a niche role, important role and we, play, we all know we do make some important innovations and contribute to that process but by and large the energy, the, the companies that supply the technology that delivers it, uh, energy, be they fossil fuel, be they nuclear, be they wind, be they solar, are based offshore. So therefore, the rate and the price at which these technologies develop will predominantly be determined by decisions that come outside of our, uh, be outside of our control as a nation. And. Um, the other point is that with every um, 
the cost of energy or any investment we make as society carries an opportunity cost. If we end up paying twice as much for our energy or anything else, well effectively what we're doing as a society is then not having the money to pay for hospitals, to pay for social disadvantage, to pay for addressing the wide range of pulls there are on our economic decision making, which is why you know politicians um, make those decisions. So it is important that we do find uh, a low cost route to our carbon, low carbon future. So therefore, uh, it seems important that we do not ignore the nuclear option at this point in time. We know that some of the technologies, um, obviously the, of the renewable energy options at the moment, wind is the lowest cost, but the places, as a very important point you made is in uh, Denmark, which has the highest rate of penetration, and South Australia is second uh, to Denmark, actually, in wind. But uh, Denmark is part of a very extensive grid, which also has nuclear and a wide range of other technologies put into it. And uh, it, 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 there's a, a lot of challenges to be overcome before we can continue to increase it dramatically. Not that they're not possible, but with every option, every technology is possible, but how much will it cost to achieve that route? And so I guess that's the issue of mitigating risk as, as to why it's important for us to at least keep it on the table. And I think to develop that point, I wouldn't advocate that the Australian government, for instance, preference nuclear over any other technology. I think that's foolish. It, again, it's picking winners when it could be that other options for Australia turn out to be more economic, either, either in the short term or the long term. But right now we have this strange situation set up in Australia, and, and Kim pointed to that, and that is that we don't have a level playing field where all these technologies can compete. We have this embedded historical dependence on coal because we have large coal reserves. We have a large range of subsidies for particular renewable energy technologies, and we have a ban on nuclear power. And what I would like to see is some decision made about a carbon price, and then to remove a lot of these subsidies in either direction, and to open up the field to nuclear electricity as well, so to put in place a sort of regulatory framework without saying oh, the government is going to build nuclear power, simply the government is going to open the, the playing field for all of these energy technologies to, com to compete, to put in place guarantees to, to for instance, stop um, protesters or legal suits in, in, in uh, foreclosing nuclear reactors before they even get built, you know. Having the right sort of framework so that everyone can compete on a fair basis and then allow the best technologies to, to ultimately win. And whether that be nuclear, whether that be gas with CCS, or whether it be wind or whatever, at least we can be reasonably assured that we're getting um, the lowest cost mitigation. Now, the whole point of that emissions trading scheme called the Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme, developed um, initially by Ross Garno and so on, was to pursue this lowest cost mitigation um, by allowing the business community to choose, pick and choose what suited them best in terms of mitigating their energy sources. For the electricity market, we haven't done that right now. and. Um, and so as it stands, we run the risk of having a limited set of options that end up costing us a lot more, whereas other nations who haven't got that limited set of options end up doing things much more economically, which leaves us further behind and eventually, when we realise our mistake, we go and try and copy them. Um, that is a real danger. I think we can head a lot of that off without picking winners. Can I ask, maybe either of you would know or maybe somebody in the audience would know, or maybe it's even common knowledge. Uh, this unlevel playing field against nuclear, where does it come from? Where does this sort of religious anti-nuclear come from? <coughs> 69, there was a project, and now there is strong opposition. <coughs> What's the reason for this in Australia? Well, I think, I think when nuclear was seriously mooted back in the 60s, um, it was just at that point when there was large-scale opposition to nuclear weapons programs, and the fact that we just had major atomic testing in the 1950s and, and early 1960s, shut off in, in the early 60s. But, you know, there was that building resentment for the pollution that fallout caused and the sort of psychological link between nuclear energy and, um, and nuclear weapons. And, and nuclear energy, for one reason or another, hadn't been established in Australia up to that point. 
so it never got its foothold, whereas in many other European countries, in the US for instance, it went through its development phase before that rising sentiment occurred. Now, that's still important, that whole non-proliferation argument is important, but the reality of the world is that atoms for peace, nuclear fission as an energy source, is being widely embraced by all of those countries who traditionally haven't, haven't had any large-scale industrial infrastructure and others foregoing the use of this technology because of these perceived historical links between nuclear weapons and nuclear energy doesn't stop the, the world moving on and using these energy sources. And so I think we, we somehow evolved to this irrational point where nuclear was bad and wasn't talked about in Australia and fossil fuels were implicitly good because the damage caused by them was never really talked about. They, they, they just provided us with reliable electricity. I think it will take a lot of time and a lot of effort to move the societal discussion in somewhere like Australia back to a more realistic frame. Um, and it's probably going to take serious development of this energy source in other countries before we really do that. So I suspect the reality is we will vacillate here for 10 or 15 years before we make a serious decision. Um, but that could be to our great detriment. Yeah. I'd like to raise the question about is there such a thing as a level playing field? And subsidies, um, subsidies are inevitable, as you kind of pointed out, but uh, initially governments invested in setting up transmission infrastructure to give us reliable electricity. And also subsidies come often maybe to try and promote industry in the country to say, we think our country can um, benefit from maybe exporting, developing a niche in this market. And so inevitably governments will invest where they think there can be broader economic investments. So there, there may not be such a thing potentially a, as a level playing field, but certainly um, it's, I think it's good to ask, maybe get some more comments and discussion about um, what some of the issues are that we need to consider in certainly removing barriers and allow us to move forwards, but by the same token recognising that um, economic investment will also, can, if, there, if we can establish, be it an industry, it could be in, in uh, renewable energy where we have particular niche expertise, it could be in a clean coal where we have a clean expertise, um, that there are many reasons why government would want to invest in supporting certain things. It needs a very big, broad-based picture. So maybe you'd like to comment, both of you, from the, the legal and some of the other issues on, on um, this question of what kind of issues we need to consider in creating a more level or, or in looking at what kind of uh, subsidies and or removal of barriers we need to consider. I can respond from a European perspective. Maybe not so much the legal Australian, but the from per comparative European perspective. And at the moment in Europe, the very much related discussion is, can we have a free and liberalized market in the first place, or should it be a government-driven market? This is now moving quite a bit from the nuclear, but that's, that's a serious discussion that is taking place because over the past 20 years, we've been firmly believing that the markets will deliver the necessary investments, both in the grid and in different types of generating technologies. A growing investment gap has now changed, or it so seems at least, changed the opinion of the legislator in Europe, the European Commission and the Council. And it seems that their conclusion is no, you cannot trust in a market-based system. Therefore, the public control is increasing now. Public, the states, European Commission, has now their say in investment decisions of companies, transmission system operators, for example. And there are backup mechanisms to act when generation investments are not coming. So the answer is maybe we can't even trust the markets. But that's interesting. In Australia, just a few months ago, we had the Energy Minister, Martin Ferguson, coming out and saying, look, prepare for rising power prices. And this is nothing to do with the carbon price. 
but just prepare for the fact that we haven't made serious investments. The market has failed to make investments in energy generation technology in Australia over the last 20 years, and we have about a $100 billion gap there that we're going to have to fill in the next 10 or 15 years. Transmission infrastructure generation capacity, uh, network upgrades and so on. Um, so I think, again, in Australia it's true that we have largely liberalised our electricity generation market and and that can work in, in, in some senses in reducing retail prices of electricity for a given system, but it's failing right now to develop the, the capacity upgrades and, the, and, uh, and so on that's required, especially in the face of moving away from coal-based generation, traditional coal and gas generation of electricity to low carbon energy forms. I think you will need some combination of a market-based approach and a government-based approach. Of course, you go to somewhere like China, it's all government-based. Um, but ultimately they're doing that because they want to develop the economy of China. You go to some other places like the US and it's almost all uh, market-based, uh, but they're not building the power plants right now. So we have got that sticking. 